She Slayers, and welcome to another episode of She Slays the Day podcast. I am your host, Dr. Lauren Brunswick, and today we have on Dr. Lacey Neville. Now, this is actually her second time being on the podcast. She was on a long time ago. I'm not really sure. Um, like, well, let's just say probably the first 30 episodes, we were talking about something completely different. Ironically, we were talking about side hustle, which at that point was her selling essential oils. And now like both of us have like six more side hustles since then. So you can just watch our evolution. Today, I have her on to talk about uh, a specific ego-based issue that I see within chiropractic. So this is something that kind of has naturally started coming out of me when I'm talking on stages or on the podcast or just one-on-one -on -one to people. And it's this concept of um, how I've lovingly termed the Girl Scout badges of chiropractic. Now, if you're a boy, you can also get Girl Scout badges. And it's basically, in my mind, these mile markers that chiropractors will often just chase aggressively without really looking at whether or not that suits them or is what they want themselves. And they think they're going to get to that point and it's going to make them happy. So do you need a couple examples? Yeah, I, I know you do. Uh, so one is the million dollar practice, right? Okay. So like, this is the like, I am pursuing being able to brag that I have a seven figure practice. Like I'm just going to be able, it's going to bring me so much happiness. Now, while people are pursuing it, they often will do this completely disregarding profitability uh, or happiness or whatever. Well, that's another one. Uh, all cash. That's another Girl Scout badge that we like to be like, mm, I'm too good for insurance. <laughs> well, let's see. What would be another one? Oh, high volume. Yes, the elusive high volume clinic. This one hurts. All of these hurt because like I spent the first 10 years of my life just like, oh, I'm gonna, this is what's gonna make me worthy. Is I'm gonna have all of these badges. Um, probably speaking on stages to chiropractors. I mean, and I would assume each like little sector of chiropractic has their own little badges. Um, and I would say probably every career, right? Has them. Um, but I think that the reason I talk about them is because I think that there's so much pain that comes when we have these expectations of what's going to happen and what it's going to be like, what, when that happens, what's going to happen for us, what we're going to feel, what our life is going to be like. And I have accrued quite a few Girl Scout badges the first 13 years of my life. And I'm sure I'll accrue many more. But one of the things that has really changed for me in the last two years is looking at goals I have and asking myself, why? Is this a goal that I'm setting for myself? Or is this a goal that I has been placed on me by society, you know, or career and deciding whether it actually works for me? You know, and if it does work for me, if this is something I do want to get to, if you want to get to a million dollar practice, having that conversation around like at the expense of what though? Do you care if you're, if you get to a million dollars, but you're only bringing home a hundred thousand dollars? Like, do you care about that? Or like, you know, and just really looking around like, okay, you want to get out of network with insurance. Like, do you care that getting new patients might be more difficult. Do you care about some of these other things? You know, like, and just really going like, why, why am I saying that's a goal? Now, one of the Girl Scout badges specifically that we are talking about today um, is kind of a sneaky one. And this is the, the natural home birth breastfeed my baby until they were 17 Girl Scout badge that chiropractors collect. And I knew I wanted to talk about this one. I'll share in the episode kind of what happened to me back when I was finishing chiropractic school and I was uh, at a Genie Ohm ICPA seminar and just kind of the thing that really started this, this ball rolling of watching this woman stand up in front of the class and carry so much shame about a birth that didn't go as planned like a decade before. And I am fortunate enough that of my two births, they were both great. Got that Girl Scout badge. I didn't get the breastfeeding badge. So we tried 
but like we had to bring in formula at like five months for Ty. I think we were able to skip formula altogether and got to 11 months with Charlie. I just was not an overproducer. I don't know. There's something weird about being more worried about losing weight and getting your clinic back up and running that just apparently uh, shoots your milk production uh, in the gut. So I don't know if that was why. But anyway, so I did not get the the breastfeeding badge, but um, I wanted to have Lacey on because I wanted to have this conversation around when birth doesn't go the way that you plan it to. And also the extra shame that female chiropractors or male chiropractors, maybe it's just prenatal and pediatric chiropractors in general, care, can carry for a really long time around that and hopefully help someone heal today. Like that's, that's my goal. Now, if you're, this is a longer episode. Uh, as Lacey was telling her birth story, I was like, in it. I was very invested in this story and I was not going to hurry her up or rush her in any way. So if you want to get past the birth story, check below in the show notes and there will be some timestamps um, that can tell you when to like, you know, when the birth story starts. If maybe you're just here for the birth story. Then like you can skip over uh, the first half hour of things we talk about. I would recommend listening to though, because it's not related to birth, but really, really good. So let's Let's learn about Lacey. Okay, so Dr. Lacey Neville is a remarkable blend of motherhood, entrepreneurship, and authenticity. She's not your typical family wellness chiropractor. Dr. Lacey is a true wellness visionary wearing multiple hats as the co-owner of Free Spirit Chiropractic. The visionary founder of Free Spirit Social for Chiropractors provides authentic coaching to chiropractors in the startup lab for chiropractors and co-creator of the Health and Wellness Podcast, free your frequency. She lives life unrestrained by society and full out. Her passion for wellness and entrepreneurship knows no bounds and her commitment to helping others achieve success both in their professional and personal lives is nothing short of inspirational. Alongside her soulmate, Dr. Colton Neville, she's on a mission to elevate consciousness and authenticity in others. That's a great episode. So let's take a breath. Today, we are going to kind of like cast out some white light from our hearts. Okay. So take a breath, relax your jaw, ground yourself, whether you're standing, sitting, going for a little jaunt around the park, grocery shopping, cleaning your house, just take a breath, take a breath of intentionality. And maybe you have not experienced a birth that didn't go as planned. Maybe you have, maybe you have healed through it. Maybe today will trigger some things for you. Maybe you have friends or patients that are holding on to this responsibility and this control that if they do everything right, that they can have control over the outcome of this birth. So like, I just want you to picture whether it is you're going to turn that mirror inward and help listen to today from a place of healing for yourself. Great. Turn that white light in on you and give yourself just a big old hug. And here's a Lauren Love squeeze through the the air frequency of however the hell podcasts work. Um, And if you haven't, I would encourage you just to like picture like this beam of white light shooting out from your heart into the world to help heal people who are still holding on to sadness, shame, whatever their feelings may be. Um, still, you know, those that are pregnant, holding on to expectations. If there's anything I've learned, um, our births went great, but our daughters have both taught me that I don't have control and to let go of expectations time and time again. So like, there's so many different ways that we can learn lessons in this life. There are people who don't plan on having children that won't get the opportunity of children messing up their perfect plans. And I just believe that God will show them in a new way. And so just let it happen gently and just help heal those who need healing. Um, In your name we pray. Amen. Okay. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Dr. Lacey Neville on the Girl Scout badge of a home birth. It's crazy to look back and go like, you were on episode 27. I wouldn't be surprised if it was in the first 50. Yeah, I think it was. How is, so I love talking about two podcasters uh, on the podcast. How, all right. 
of course, you're happy you started the podcast. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts about podcasting and having a podcast now that you're on this side of it? I mean, yeah, it's great, but it is so much work. Mm -hmm. And I actually, so we have a guy that he records and he does all of our like um, video and everything. I love your guys' setup. Thank you. Yes. But like you're paying for that. Yeah, 100%. And yeah. people don't realize like how much time, how much money. And it's like, you have to schedule things out, especially when you have, you know, people co- like helping you or coming with you. And so it's like week by week changes. Um, Cause it's your guests are always in person. Mm-hmm. Always in person. You, do you think you'll stay with that? You know, I don't, I don't think it'll be a long-term like in person. I think some for sure. Yeah. It's funny how many people will pull up the podcast and they're like, Oh, there's a video to this. Mm -hmm. And they're like 10 episodes in. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was something that we were like, Oh, we want to beat in person. That way we can like talk face to face. Mm -hmm. What we're realizing is schedule is hard. And it's weird. People don't really want to be in person anymore. Post COVID times. Do you think that's because they don't want to be on camera or it's like, what do you think? I think a little bit of all, I think it's like that social awkward, especially for, I mean, obviously we have other people than just chiropractors on the chiropractors are just like rolling. Most of the time we have to have like, you know, two hours of podcasts, like where we split it, but it's like the other health providers or birth workers or Mm. what, where it's like, they are doing in-home one-on-one visits. They don't even have an office space anymore. Well, that Okay. So is the goal to be very Tulsa focus? No. So it's okay. just like health and wellness. Okay. In general. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot, I think another thing I could see running into is a lot of the, a lot of like healthcare people don't have to market. No. And so they don't, they're not used to going on camera. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, and you were like, yeah. oh my gosh, I, I had been on camera like 30 times before our doors opened, like, yep. and you're clamming yep. up about, yeah. I know um, it is. it's so interesting. And then just like the diversity of the different personalities and, you know, Colton and I have a very similar, both Enneagram sevens, mm-hmm. very similar personalities. And then we have a co-host Kylie, who she helps with like our social media and stuff. And she's a little bit more of that younger, like it's, it's funny, like listening to her, like re recording on the podcast. And then you have like people of all ages of different personalities. And you're like, so and you're like pulling questions out of them versus like, we just had a huge family. They're a family of nine who they have a huge following on social media. They moved to Oklahoma during COVID times for freedom and all the things. And they have nine, seven kids. There's nine of them. And, uh, they were just like talking, talking, talking. And then we got on like conspiracy theories and all these things. And we're like, okay, reel it back in, which we love that. Yeah. But it's just, it's funny to like keep people on track too with a different yeah. personality. Yeah. Um, I realized that like, so you, do you get like email for recommendations of guests? Okay. So I realized actually pretty early on that those guests tend to be pretty good because they've yeah. just done multiple podcasts. Yeah. I also realized pretty early on that if I haven't met someone in person, large social media following does Mm -hmm. not mean good on podcast. No, no, (laughs) no. no. And even like in the practice, right? You like see these, I'm going to call them like mom influencers, especially, Mm -hmm. especially like the homesteader type, all of that, where they're like, so you think they're going to be such an extrovert in person because their social media is like face talking all day long about everything, you know, picking up shit from their pig pin and all of that. And then they come in and you're like, well, you are a totally different person, like a little clean. (laughs) Maybe you need to have like a free your mind cocktail hour. Yeah. I love that. Or the free your frequency. (laughs) Post 75 hard. I'm in 75 hard right now. Oh God. I saw that. Have I like (laughs) ugged any of your thing on social media yet? (laughs) Like I'm like, oh, I know. Everybody's like, what's that? We just actually launched a um, episode last week about us talking as a team because our whole team is doing and just like talking about like what challenges, what areas of growth, like what what has really surprised us with it. And everybody was like, I feel like yours is going to be the alcohol. And I was like, I love that, but also kind of like what? Because I love a good- I'm offended. You know that? (laughs) (laughs) I love a good mezcal drink. And so I was like, no, honestly, for me, it's truly like the time management portion, especially with running workouts. For those that don't know, like two workouts can't be back to back. And one has to be outside. Two 45 minute workouts? Yeah, 45 minutes. Yeah. 
And so that's hard. I mean, especially as you know, adjusting high volume. I mean, most days Colton and I together are seeing 250 people. And so it's like, you have, you have to time manage and say, okay, well, you know what, at our three hour lunch break where people think we have so much free time that we're doing all the back end CEO shit. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, well, we're meetings, we're doing zoom calls and we're having our outdoor walk to like fit Mm -hmm. that in. So, but it's, it's, have you guys, you guys have an associate, right? Or you're we hired. just hired two. Okay. You hired yeah. two associates. Yeah. At the same time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. All the fun things coming for free spirit. Yeah. So they actually had been in practice for a year okay. in Texas and they Do took they our coach. Yeah. They're together. Oh, and okay. So husband, yeah. wife, okay. uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, but okay. yeah, they've been together for a really long time. They actually took our coaching group with the startup lab and loved it. They almost doubled their practice in 90 days, like super pumped. But afterwards, they were just like, man, I just don't know if business ownership is really for me. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we see, you know, everybody sees, especially as you know, this too, they see like what your office is doing and think, especially out of school. Oh, I can do Mm -hmm. that. Like they don't realize how much grit actually goes into that grit and and um, fucking overhead. Yeah, right. It's been you two docs for a little bit, but like it's just like if you think that I'm bringing home 1.5 million dollars, oh, you would be very incorrect, (laughs) right? Yeah, and that's the thing is like you know you want to take care. We have three CAs; they're freaking amazing. They get paid extremely well too, Mm -hmm. and so it's like that payroll. Like people don't realize that you want to keep good employees because you have to them well yeah especially in the age yeah um and like I was talking to Denisa and basically and Elise and basically mm-hmm. what they're paying in Denver and Dallas is what I'm paying in Rice Lake so like RCAs for a full-time CA although they don't get health care um but they do get a lot of vacation they make yeah. starting 38 and I have one making closer to 50 like then it's like, yeah. Mm-hmm, yeah, you can almost find a associate for that, which is wrong. Yeah, but like, 100%. Yeah. 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 So, and that's the thing too. Like, you know, you look at, you know, we're big on freedom in our practice too. So we look at that every year and we calculate how many days off that we've given our employees or our team every year. It's been close to 60 days. And that doesn't include their 10 days of PTO, wow. you know, and I'm like that is a lot of time. And you, that's we really lot. only work, you know, 28 hours. Right. Yeah, no, that is definitely been, I think that like the broader and like anybody who would like dissect conversations I have on podcasts or things I say on social, like it's very clear that like that is something on my heart for mm-hmm. the last year. And I think that there's, so I think there's so much room to just continue inspiring associates. Yeah. So like, I think that like the reason that we have so many docs going into starting their own practice is we don't have programs for associates. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, well, we have programs to grow your clinic. We have programs. And I'm just as much at fault. Like my program doesn't take an associate. And so it's like you dangle this golden carrot and Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, okay, I guess I'm just, this is no guidance. No. Yeah. And that's, that's the crazy thing too, is like, I remember being in school and obviously Colton and I were like, that wasn't even an option for It us. wasn't even a you know? thought in my head that I would be an associate. Yeah. But so many students, especially during the whole 2020 time, especially during that time has came in like shadowed the office for us specifically. And it has been so interesting to see, even in, you know, Colton and I only graduated waited six years ago, seven years ago. And it is so wildly different what they are learning and like even their technique portion. When Colton and I were in school, we were going to seminars literally every weekend. And now it's like seminars aren't even offered like that. And so that's kind of crazy too. It makes you wonder as a profession, like what has changed Like, are we not doing as much to like engage with those students to really shape them of like, hey, talking to them in school and saying, you know, being an associate can be really badass and can, you know, set you up for financial freedom. Because that's the big thing that everybody thinks that you'll receive once you open your own practice, right? LOL. You're going to sit over here and laugh. (laughs) Yeah, right. Like I always laugh. I mean, I love, I love her. Cody Sanchez. She is awesome. Did you see 
Yes, one hundred percent. And I was like, yes, I love yes, Cody. Yes. I know, but I'm like, you cannot keep pushing people because it is really awesome to be a part of a team. Um, Andy Frisella just did an episode where he talked about how he has this massive team and how he has these guys come or, you know, women too, but come and shadow him. And they're like, I want to create something like this. And he's like, well, why don't you just join my team and be a part of the big movement? I mean, that's ideally the goal. So why aren't we talking to students about that? Right. I think that's that big missing gap, right? It's like most of the time in school, you're told, oh, you either have to open your own practice and you're probably going to fail and you have to do X, Y, and Z to be successful. Or it's like, okay, well, you could actually graduate and hate what you're doing and go work at, I hate to knock on it, but the joint Mm -hmm. and also have a part-time job at Best Buy Mm because that's what you're worth. And that's like the shitty part about it. Yeah. I think as a profession, we just have to step up and start engaging and talking about why it's important to be more team focused. Well, I think, I mean, I've seen, so I've been posting jobs for Mm -hmm. a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. And it is insane. So like my, the people that I roll with tend to be cash kairos, yeah. um, a lot of family focus. Mm-hmm. And for some reason I'm off putting to rehab docs. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen just salaries go up in a year and a half. And yep. I do think that that is something that us cash family practice docs are being forced to own. Like we like followed inflation for our CAs. Yeah. And then it's just like, man, can't get an associate around here. And it's yep, like, what do yep. you pay? 50 grand. And it's like, oh, yep. you totally could do that like three years ago. Yep. Can't do that no more. Sorry. And mm-hmm. it's like, but then what happens is, is they like, you know, some of the, some Cairo companies, like um, whatever hiring companies, they won't even yeah. talk to you unless you're offering $85,000 yeah. for a salary. Yeah. And then docs are going, I can't afford yeah. $85,000 salary. Yeah. So then it's like, okay, so then we need to fix that first. So like, mm-hmm. that's like all these like little things yep. that I'm like, okay, so first we need to help with the profitability that's of family right. practices. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's a big thing, right? I mean, we mm-hmm. see that with people that we've coached or even like just spoke to over the years and it's like, oh, I'm seeing a thousand people a week, but I'm only bringing in, you know, $20,000 a month. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, like we got to work on profitability here. Mm-hmm. You know, just, I think again, going into like coaching groups and things like that, it's like, we look at this big picture, but we don't realize like that one size fits all is not for everybody. No, no. And it, I mean, my heart does hurt for the problem because the core of the problem is you want to serve families and you want everyone to be able to afford chiropractic. Yeah. So when you've got a family of nine and you value getting checked weekly, Mm-hmm. Like we go like, uh, mm, but if I just was in network with their insurance, then it would be free, mm-hmm. but I'm mm-hmm. not network with insurance. So then I need to make sure that they can come to me. And so you end up giving like $17 adjustments. Yeah. And then you talk to these docs and you're like, well, what's your cost per adjustment? And they're like, I don't know. I have like $250,000 of student loans. And you're like, all right, well, I'm not even talking about that. Yeah. I'm talking yeah. about your overhead. Yeah. And they're yeah. like, oh, uh, let me figure that out. And they don't even know. <laughs> you're, yeah. like, you're losing money. So yeah, truly. It's so yeah. So fix the profitability. Then yep. salaries can go up. Yeah. Then people can like look and see a possibility of making 90 to 150 as an associate in their career, not necessarily coming out of school, yeah. but like yeah. if you can show, like, yeah, stick with me for three years, yeah, five yeah. years, 10 years, I can show you a path that this mm. can continue. Yeah. But also associates, you have to be invested in helping grow. Like you don't just get a raise every year because yeah. of a raise, like yeah. help me grow the practice. Uh, any plan for an associate to get them to $150,000, like, yeah, five years from now, this is yeah. where you're going to be at. It involves more money coming in yep. and more work. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the other thing that I haven't yep. seen a big connection. I'm not even talking about with my associates specifically, yeah. just like the broader audience of like how many docs have been like, I got confronted at our annual review saying mm-hmm. that they feel they're working too hard and mm-hmm. they want to race. Mm. And so it's like, that's mm-hmm. not how business works though. Yeah. Like you want yeah. more money and it is going to involve working harder. Yeah. Or and smaller. like define working hard too. I feel that so hard right now with just 
the newer generation, unfortunately, I mean, I have a CA that is in that younger generation, but then like, even whenever we were doing interviews with brand new doctors right out of school, it was like their mindset around what is actually like hard work is so different Mm -hmm. from where Colton and I, where you are, I know. And it's like even other mentors that we have. And so it's like, okay, define that. And so it really takes, again, like, especially being a leader with associates and your team members too, of like, what is actually fueling you? Because that can change every six months or every quarter Mm -hmm. even. And that's the hard part too, about running your business. It's like, you're not only running the actual like profitability side of things, but managing a team and leading a team is a whole other thing as well. And I found when we got, so I think at one point, it's funny, it's like kids, uh, I lose track of how many kids a patient has once they get five or more. Yeah. I'm like, I don't yeah. know. Six, six, uh, so yeah. same thing happens with employees. I think we had like 12 employees at some point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I could sit here and calculate, but that's boring podcast. Um, <laughs> and I realized that it was like three clinics, 12 employees. And I was like, oh no, I don't like this. I don't yeah. like it. This, yep. And now other chiropractors, and I don't think I had like proper scaling measures. Like, so I'm yeah. not saying one day it couldn't be a possibility, But I didn't like managing that many people. No, no. And so like sometimes it just gets like takes hitting up against the wall and being like, oh, I don't like it. So maybe that's what. Less is more. Yeah. Maybe they just need to start practices and be like, this is hard. And you're like, yes, it is. Yeah. And that, you know, especially if anyone's listening and you're opening a practice with like a significant other or a friend or anything like that, that was the hard part for Colton and I is when we started interviewing, you know, it took a long time. Colton in year two was like, Lacey, we're going to have to hire other doctors. And I was like, absolutely not. This will only be our practice. It's a family practice, you know, blah, 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 blah. All the like limiting mindset things. And last year, you know, I had Luca Colton was seeing 600 people a week by himself. He was so burnt out. He's still is feeling, I feel like the effects of that, like, okay, it's really time to like not continue this. Mm-hmm. And, um, it was really interesting because we had always said, unfortunately, whenever you do open up as a couple, you are not able to take a day off and leaving your high volume practice to just one person, one doc. And we had always said, okay, well, we'll just hire one and then see if another one falls in. So when they both were like, Hey, we've been in practice. We know you personally, we've already seen them, how they communicate and everything. I was like, this is a major risk, but I'm willing to do that. Because if you lose one, you're losing both. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it's possible that one, but like more than likely yeah, you you don't lose one of your four or yeah, one of the two you lose both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. And so it's like figuring that out. And, you know, Colton and I, obviously we take a lot of time off. So it's like, Hey, we want to be able to keep the practice afloat and have two people running the practice, just like me and him were. Mm-hmm. And so that's the big thing, but it is again, like challenges. And just, again, it's one of those things that it's going to be a learning experience as you know, we didn't expect to hire two. And we have a whole lot of other things. I always feel like this is how the universe works too. It's like when something gets a little bit sticky, it's like, all right, let's take this risk. And then another risk can come Mm -hmm. that Um, we're in the process of buying a building another building much larger too and I'm like of course everything just happens within the first two months of 2024 Mm -hmm. that's how business ownership works right the risks um okay so we (laughs) talked about one of my favorite soapboxes but I specifically had you on (laughs) ADHD retrack here to talk about another one of my yes favorite soapboxes so I'm probably going to do an entire episode on, because I, I, I've kind of coined the term, like the Girl Scout badges that um, <laughs> chiropractors are like subconsciously chasing from the moment they graduate. And I think that, you know, I, I don't want to speak for like the males listening. I don't want to like be disrespectful of their experience becoming a father and like the pressures that they feel, but you're not a man. And I'm not a man. So today we're going to be talking about the pressures of like being the actual carrier of the baby and the deliverer of the baby into the world and the one who can feed the baby and all of that stuff. So like, there's my like super PC, like men, sorry, we're not talking about you today. Yeah. Um, okay. So you are... I mean, you are in birth fit, we're in birth fit, like yeah, yeah. you are a prenatal and pediatric chiropractor. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I would imagine that you had certain ideals 
-hmm. around what getting pregnant, what your pregnancy was going to look like and your birth and postpartum. Yes. Can you talk about like, take yourself back to pre-Luca, like what were some of the like ideals or like subconscious thoughts, especially too, Mm -hmm. that like even in retrospect, you didn't realize you had. Yeah, totally. So I actually, yeah, I coached with BirthFit. I had my own BirthFit company that was local to Tulsa. So what BirthFit is at that time was I had prenatal postpartum classes. They were specifically movement classes. So like core pelvic floor, but preparing for labor, healing postpartum. And I also did birth education classes. On top of that, I also obviously with all the extra Um, seminars and techniques and things like certifications for prenatal postpartum pediatric care. I also was a birth doula. So I actually did that whenever we were zoning the practice, it took around the nine months to from the day we purchased it to the day we opened. And I did a lot of doula work and I was doing remote, so to speak, chiropractic care. I took care of mostly during that time, prenatal, um, funny is one of the major hospitals in town. I had at one time, nine of the trauma nurses, the ER, um, they were all pregnant. And so they just kept referring and I was like, well, I'm just going to be adjusting out of my house. And then I did some doula work for some of them and just some other clients. So obviously my perception of birth was, and I had been to all different types of births. I've been to home births. I had been to planned C-sections, unplanned C-sections, hospital, vaginal, like all the things. So my perception, especially as a chiropractor was home birth, right? Natural Mm -hmm. birth, do it all. And I think that too, like we get into, I always call it like wearing our hats, right? It's like, okay, well, when you're in the room as a doula, you have to only wear your doula hat. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to remove that chiropractic prenatal hat, but it's like, they hired you for this one specific thing. Same thing as like the chiropractor or even the mom or anything like that. What would be the difference? Like in the moment Mm -hmm. being in the room and like what kind of chiropractor thought comes in that you're like, no, not right now. I'm being a doula. Yeah. So especially my hospital births, right? It's like, I know specifically what could help them. Like, let's say a mom stalls out. I've had this happen and I'm doing all the movements, but legally I can't sit in there and adjust a mom. And it's like, even though I know, and I've had those conversations with OBs, it's like hospital policy, right? Like you can't do these things. I actually have had a few, whenever I was in the hospital, um, she was a midwife that she literally got kicked out post COVID because she was letting moms have the choice in whatever style of birth that they wanted in the hospital. Oh my gosh. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's crazy. The birth community here is very interesting as well. But she would actually step out of the room and be like, all right, I'm going to go get a sip of water and let like you do your doula things and like look at me in the eyes like, okay, you need to adjust this mom. And, you know, 99% of the time we would have a great delivery after that. And so, but I've also been met with that, like, oh, absolutely not chiropractic in this space. Like what even is that? You're not doing that. And so that's that hard ball too. Cause it's like, you have those conversations, especially as someone that is supporting a mother when a dad during labor, it's like, you know, this can come up when you go this route. I just want you to know mm-hmm. that I won't be able to be your chiropractor during this moment. And those are hard conversations because mm-hmm. mom and dad, especially if the outcome isn't what they expected, they're like, oh, well, why didn't we do this? Why couldn't we have done that? And so that's where it's really hard. So that's actually why I don't do much birth work anymore as the doula. It just became too hard. Or I mean, the scheduling, right? You guys see scheduling, viability, week, like, I'll be back in like one hour to a day or a half. Yeah, Yeah, truly. I mean, and that was the thing too. It's like the schedule and just even to like liability wise, there's so many chiropractors I know that will go to births and adjust and they don't realize the liability of it. And it's truly the big thing that I can recommend. And I saw this firsthand when I was a doula is unfortunately, a lot of midwives don't carry malpractice insurance because it is extremely expensive. expensive. Mm-hmm. And so if something does go, your malpractice is the pr- primary yeah. in the room then. Yeah. Oh, so even shit. when I was a doula, even though I had malpractice and I wasn't there as the chiropractor, it still put me at risk. And so I was yeah. like, that is just something I'm not willing to do mm-hmm. anymore. So it was a really into that, like tiny little thing. We were subcontracting, subcontracting out of a nurse practitioner's office. And like when we were combining malpractices, it was like, oh, just so you know, 
Mm -hmm. uh, your malpractice might actually be like the buck stops. She had it, but it was yeah. like one of those things where if hers defaulted, like mine was going to happen. Yep. And I was like, oh no, I don't like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the hard part too. Like as chiropractors that want to wear all of these multiple hats and do it all. It's just like, you have to get really clear on what liability wise. Mm -hmm. And then also because the same thing with birth fit, it's like, I was training women that were literally using barbells and kettlebells and things like that fitness training, so to speak. And it was like, I had to have a whole different type of insurance for that. But if it was at free spirit chiropractic, then it was like all the liabilities, right? Yeah. But going yeah. to jail is a, one of the Girl Scout badges. So, yeah. you know, truly, yeah, you're going to go the risk. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I think just going back to that question is, especially being so submerged in the birth world, natural birth was like a no brainer. Yeah. I mean, Colton and I, even though Luca was our first, we were like, okay, do we even want to even have a provider? And that means like a midwife, or do we want to just like go all in and free birth it? Colton mm -hmm. was a little bit more like, mm, let's have a midwife just in case, you know, thankfully. But yeah, so it is, it was really hard, especially like looking back because there are some things and this is again goes back into like the more you know type thing and it's like looking back even at how the birth played out it's like okay well what if you play that what if card all the time mm -hmm. what if this what if we tried this instead of this would the outcome be different and that's the big thing as chiropractors especially and I'm sure we'll go into birth story and all of that but that is something that I've had so many chiropractors especially women chiropractor business owners reach out to me and be like, so thankful for your story. I read it when I was pregnant mm -hmm. and it actually gave me because the outcome was not what I expected. I am actually more at peace than I thought I ever would be. And yeah. that's really empowering too. And that's why I shared my story, like how I shared it. Yeah. Um, did you go in with an open mind that it may not turn out the way you wanted to? Yes. And yes. I will say because of being a birth doula, I also teach birth education classes. So, and I know like free birth community right now is massive. I have had more free birth moms this past year than I ever have. What's a free birth? And free birth means that you're birthing with you and your partner only with no provider. So no midwife, you're just at home or wherever you could be down at the local river if you wanted to yep. just birthing your baby, very primal, very innate planned pre-birth or free birth. Uh, yeah. 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 Planned not accidental, but it is one of those things too, that looking back at that, you know, free birth is like, oh, well, unconstrained by society. You know, if you plan for the negative outcome or what you want to pertain as the negative outcome, um, that could happen to you because you're already putting it in your mindset. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, that whole and, mindset of like, yeah. it's not going to happen. It's not yeah. going to happen. Don't even, yeah. And I am like, absolutely not. You have to know like, yes, this is plan a, and you have to have a pivot plan, but you have to have a whole redirect plan mm -hmm. because that was one thing, like, especially leading up to the 60 something hours that I was in labor. I knew my midwife had let me push the limits, but she had also said, Hey, let's try all of these things. I knew too, that we had tried all the things yeah. because even when my doulas, I had two doulas and my two midwives were there and we were trying all the things I'd be like, okay, well, let me try this thing because this feels innate or I know of again, doula hat, this has helped another mom. Yeah. And so that's the thing, like you have to plan, especially, especially as a chiropractor, because the outcome will also be what the outcome is of your practice, especially if you own it. It's like, if you have a vaginal birth, I don't recommend oh, coming, yeah, you know, no before, kidding. but like you can come back a lot earlier if needed mm -hmm. versus when you have a C-section, you are physically unable, especially if you have a high volume practice to start adjusting again for minimum 10 weeks. Yeah. So, yeah. And that, yeah. That makes sense. You have to plan. Um, one of the things, so do you know, Dr. Nathan Riley, the holistic yeah. guy? Okay. Mm -hmm. So he was on the podcast in January Yeah, and one of the things where we were talking about out of hospital births is like, basically he brought up like, well, it just depends on how comfortable you are with a stillbirth or like yeah. the, the like worst case scenario mm -hmm. of like, yep. well, your baby didn't survive. And yeah. like, that was one of those things where I was like, oh, you know, like, and yeah. it was just so matter of fact, not like unkind or anything, but just like when you are talking about these out of hospital options, like he said, like, I can't assume that a woman isn't willing for that outcome 
it, and I and I was just like, oh my gosh, what? And so it is um it is one of those things, you know, like I don't feel like I'm articulating it well because I don't want to like put words in his mouth, but he was basically saying, it's not my job to assume, no. hey, this is unsafe for your baby. So now we need to. Like yeah. it's the mom's choice of whether she's willing to risk that outcome for her baby. And I was just like, oh, and like I think that's where a lot of Kairos probably get, I'm just gonna use the phrase like sucked into the hospital system. Yeah. You yeah. know, like they're like maybe like, oh yeah. I would love to have a home birth or I would love to, because then I would get that badge. I'd be able to like brag about that shit. Yeah. But then it's like, but I'm not willing to risk if something extra bad happens. Yeah. So, yeah. and like, and then it's like, okay, that's okay. Absolutely. You're allowed to ha decide where you're at on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So let's okay. talk. Yeah. Talk about, um, let's talk about the birth. Yeah. So, um, for those that haven't read the story, I actually went into labor with Luca at 38 weeks and three days, which is seen sometimes as like, oh yeah, it's the safety net, especially for home birth in Oklahoma. They really want you to go like 37, five before they say, oh, you have to risk out and go to the hospital. Anything before that my, uh, I adjusted a full Wednesday, high volume. And I was one of those people too, like people all the time were asking me, I bet you're so ready to have the baby and all of these things. And I was like, are, you know, are you going to take some time off before? And I was like, no, I'm going to work up until literally mm -hmm. I have this baby and you'll be lucky if my water doesn't break right here on the table. Like it was always a joke. Like I would yeah. go into labor at the office. Um, I left that night, Colton and I, we never found out the gender of Luca. It was a full moon. And we actually were sitting outside on our back porch talking about whether we thought it was a boy or a girl. And it was this like strawberry full moon, very large moon. And I actually have a picture Colton took of me. I'm like in a sports bra, like my hair all messy and I'm on this big birth ball. And it was like at nine o'clock at night, we went to bed. Colton was like just falling asleep at the time we had a TV in our room, which we don't have any longer. Um, and he was watching something and all of a sudden I like woke up, it was 11 o'clock and I just felt like a big pop and a big gush. And I, it's so weird because especially being a birth doula, I was like, in my mind thought no fucking way that this is my water breaking. Right. And you know, because most first time moms go 41 and a half, you know, all the things yeah. I thought X, Y, and Z, all that expectations. And I was like, woke up Colton. And he was like, what? Like barely drifting off. And I was like, I think I just peed the bed. And he was like, <laughs> he like was in a daze and he like felt around. He was like, I don't think that's pee. That's a shit ton of water. And I was like, it's pee, Colton, it's pee, you know? So I get up and I'm like, so whenever you have a home birth, a lot of times what you'll get is like a birth kit. And so yep. there's little swabs where you can test the fluid to see if it's pee or amniotic fluid. So I immediately went in there and did it and it turned bright blue. And that means amniotic fluid. And I was like, no fucking way. So I text my midwife. I was like, Hey, I potentially pee the bed, you know, I I, you know, all this stuff. And she's like, and I've worked with her so many times. And she's like the grandma, like she's delivered, literally been there supporting over 4,000 births in Tulsa. And she's like, did you test it? And I was like, yeah. She's like, well, send me a picture. Like, is it clear? And I was like, no. She's like, well, what color is it? Is it blue? And I was like, I don't know. And she's like, I cannot with you. She's like, just get some rest. She's like, I know you. you oh yeah, like, you know, just go to sleep. Go, you go to sleep. sleep. Yeah. yeah, right? Like you've done all the things. Like baby will probably be here. You'll be calling me at 2 a.m. So Colton and I, obviously I'm like, no, the birth tub's not even up. Like the mm -hmm. shit's not even ready. So I get the whole environment. It's like 2 a.m. at that time, but nothing was happening. And so Colton and I go lay down and we're like talking about, oh my gosh, like in the morning, I'm more than likely gonna have this baby. But like, weirdly, I never thought like nothing, like, in that moment, you're so excited too. And you're just yeah. thinking like, oh, oh yeah, I'm sure you guys are like putting your like plan into action for the clinic. Like, hey, yep. we need to cancel yep. the patients. Absolutely. Like yep. texting the team at 2 a.m., all the things, you know, and that was a thing too. I will say, especially when you run your own practice, because we were literally both going to be out. People are assuming they're like, oh my God, she's in labor. She's having the baby. Yeah. So we had text that, went to bed, woke up the next morning and literally it was like 6 a.m., so we didn't really get much sleep and nothing was happening. I was still kind of leaking a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I had texted the midwife and I was like, Hey, I just woke up. Nothing's really happening. And she was like, okay, which weirdly she had been at five births within 48 hours. Like Ooh. they were, there were so many 
um, babies being born during that time. And so she was like, just fall asleep, like just keep resting, just and I'll check in with you later in the day. So we went, I got up mentally. Are are you starting to, what are you thinking mentally at this point? Mentally at this point, I'm still kind of like, it's fine. It's fine. No big deal. You know, I'm like, this happens all the time. We got up, we went to the coffee shop, which is like our favorite local coffee shop. It was so funny because the guy that was the barista, he's seen us a million times. He's like, what's up y'all? And all this stuff. And I'm like in there in a birth fit tank top with these shorts. Cause it's hot as hell. Mind you, it's like not even 9am at this point. It's over a hundred degrees. And, um, yeah, it was hot. And he's like, you know, oh my gosh, like, you know, are you getting so excited to become parents? And Colton's like literally any minute. And he's like, any minute. And he was like, yeah, she literally, her water broke last night. And he was like, what the fuck? Like, why are you in here? So leisure, you know, in his mind, especially being a dude, he's like, the baby should be coming out. Dude, don't deliver your baby (laughs) in my coffee shop. Yeah. And I'm like, I just want a latte, like all this stuff. And he's like, do I need to grab you like towels? Like, is that everything? I'm like, Colton's like, no, bro, it's not like that. It's fine. So I'm like texting the midwife and she's like, just go for a walk before it gets too hot. So we're like, okay. So it's funny because a few nights ago in 75 hard, we walked to the same park and it was like late at night that we walked when I was in labor. And I was like, Oh, this is so funny. Like last time we were here, it was like so hot. We were trying to get the baby out. And he was like, yeah, you made me fucking walk so many miles that day. I mean, I made him walk probably seven miles just in the morning at Mm -hmm. 9am in a hundred degrees. And I'm just like trucking, right? I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm walking. I'm trying to get the contractions going. And that it was so hot by that time. And we're like slowly calling some people just saying, Hey, you know, like the team put out a thing that said like, Hey, we're closed today. This was a Thursday. And, uh, my, I text my mom and she was like, what's going on? I was like, Oh, we're going into whole foods. We're getting like charcuterie stuff at this point. And she was like, charcuterie. What do you mean charcuterie? And I'm like, I'm getting ready for like labor. Like I want a charcuterie board as a snack board. And she's like, what do you mean you're getting ready for labor? Like she had no idea. And I'm like, yeah, I like my water broke last night. And she's like freaking out. My best friend lives in Minnesota at the time. She's freaking out. And I'm like, dude, it's fine. Like everybody stop freaking out. We're just like slow rolling with it. And so at that time, still good. So my midwife checks in and she's like, hey, it's like probably 11 or noon at this time. And she's like, hey, I want you to come by. I want to just like, see where you're at. want to feel your belly, like all these things. And I was like, okay, she's like, come by at three. I'm going to take a nap on my couch. Total midwife move. She's like, I'm so sleepy, all this stuff. So we go, I make Colton walk into this old abandoned mall. That's like, literally there's a Dillard's and a Foot Locker. And <clears throat> people are still wearing masks, waiting on the shoe launch. And um, this was 2021. And it's hot as hell. They don't even have AC anymore in this mall. But I was like, it is cooler in here than it is outside. So let's walk the mall. Like we were the typical mall walkers during that time. We walked literally until my appointment at three. So yeah, Colton was like, I've had four hours of sleep. I'm like literally exhausted. What is happening? And I'm just like still in good spirits at this point. So we roll up to the midwife and she's like, you know, in there and I went in there and got checked. And I, that was a big thing. I didn't want to be checked, but she was like, I really want to check you. Like, Mm -hmm. I really want to check you. She's like, trust me. Like, I wouldn't check you. This will probably be the only time I just want to see where you're at. And so she checked and she was like, "Mm, okay. She's like, I want you to go home and take castor oil. And I was like, in, this is when my doula brain came on. I was like, why, why are we pushing labor whenever it's really just, you know, not starting? And she was like, you are literally not effaced. You are at zero. I mean, literally tight, tight, tight. And she was like, I don't really feel any fluid anymore. And I was like, so this is like, I have to do the castor oil. And she was like, you, I would really recommend that you do the castor oil. She's like, cause after 24 hours, when your water is broken, they risk you out a lot of times to go to the hospital because of risk of infection. So I was like, mm, I'm going to wait a little bit. So I got back in the park. I will tell you. I'd be like, well, I guess we're going to the hospital yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. This and is where when Nathan Riley's talking about like, you have to ride. I'm like, all right, I'm checked out. 100%. Okay. And so I get in the car and I honestly like break down crying. I was like, what the fuck? My body is not doing what it needs to. I was like, we got to go get adjusted again, which I had already stopped by the office and got adjusted that morning. And so Colton's like, you just need to relax. So I will say too, I started like almost panicking because I was like, I know what this means. Like if my 
you know, mm-hmm. the body's not doing what it needs to do by midnight tonight. She's going to tell me I need to go to the hospital. That is a non-negotiable at this point. And so, cause even though you plan for X, Y, and Z, it's like, you still have those non-negotiables in your mind where you're like, there's no fucking way that this is going to happen to me. Right. I've moved my body at eight healthy. I've done all the things to prepare for this moment. So fast forward that night, she comes by and my parents are there. They're all drinking beer with Colton, like having the time of their lives. They're thinking, oh, the midwife's coming. Things are going to start to pick up. I started actually feeling a little bit more contractions from after she checked me to yep. uh, that night. And she came in, she, te- she checked and she was like, I want to check you again. I was, we had all the conversation. Like I didn't want to be checked. And she was like, you're only a two, but you're 0% e-based. And she was like, I really need you to start thinking about your plan B. And in that moment, I was like, I'm gonna be honest with you. No. And she was like, what do you mean? No. I mean, mind you, she is like the grandma midwife. Yeah. And like, this is just, that's not part of the plan. And she's like, I understand you have plans, but like, we have to plan for the plan B. And I was like, give me a minute. So I went outside. And Why were my- you being so stubborn in that moment? What do you I think? Because think- I was still in that trust the body process, which I'm so glad that I was, because I think too, especially this is where the doula brain comes about is mm-hmm. it's like, you know, there's a ton of research articles that say that the 24 hour mark is not necessarily a right thing. In Europe, they let you go up to 72 hours. And you think about two ancestral times, because I'm a huge Western price person as well. They talk about how a lot of times women's water would break and they would go a whole week before they had the baby. So it's like, there are processes. Do I think that the adjusting maybe also at a higher still rate? Mm -hmm. Like they also had a higher mortality rate of babies. I know. Yes. But yeah. And so that's the things it's like, you have to think about all of those. And so I was weighing options as a three, I have to ask. Yeah. And just was there any, um, so, okay. Was it a hundred percent trust the body? Was there any, like, I don't want to be the chiropractor that had the C-section. I don't think that as much because okay. I think about that. I do think it's more of trust the body. Like I knew my body was slowly starting to do its job. I just hate the timeline. And this even was whenever I was a doula, I saw this so many times, like women being put on timelines. Yes. So as soon as they hear timelines okay, that were made up for medical. Yes. Yes. And you look at the history of childbirth too. And you're like, that timeline doesn't even make sense. Like the body is progressing. And I hate to say it's like slowly progressing, but it was slowly progressing. And so she was like, I came back and I said, Ruth, I'm either going to have this baby by myself or you're going to let me go another 24 hours. And I had already sent her all the research articles and she was like, you know what? I'll let you do it. I trust you. I trust your body. She said, but at the end of the day, if something does go wrong, I am not at risk here. And I said, absolutely. You are not at risk. I am taking all risks. And in that moment, Colton's like, what the fuck are the risks? You know, like he's thinking, you know what the risks are. Yeah. When I came out to my parents, they were like, so excited. Colton's parents were there. They're like, what did the midwife say? And I was like, well, I'm either going to have this baby here by myself without her, or she's going to let me go another 24 hours. And they both were like, it's clear that we need to give you some space. And I was like, yep, everybody leave now. We're going to leave. Yep. So Friday came and my contraction started and around three o'clock, she was like, Hey, you need to take castor oil. That you night, you still hadn't taken the fucking I hadn't castor, taken the castor oil. oil. So that night, Let's I will see. say <laughs> that will say at midnight that night after she left, we went to the only Walgreens around that was open twenty four hours. You didn't even her. have castor oil in the house. No, you didn't even Colton, go to Whole Foods while it was open to. No, Colton it. literally bought hair castor oil, <laughs> and I chugged that and threw it all up. So. And he literally looks at me and he's like, don't be a badass and try to chug it. And then I look at the bottle and I'm like, Colton, go back to the store and get some fucking regular castor oil. So we waited until the next day. She's like, get some castor oil, some actual castor oil. I did like the midwives brew. Really, I just shot it back like a shot with orange juice. And I will say, if anybody is listening and has taken castor oil, it is the worst shit. Like it will make you shit your brains out. It'll make you throw up. Literally, you're expelling everything. So once I started doing that, I started feeling the contractions more. And that was when to my mindset, I was like, oh, I weirdly, I enjoyed the feeling of being in labor. I'm sure. I'm right? sure. Because it was like a mindset turnaround for me. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, I'll fucking do castor oil all day. Mm-hmm. And Colt's like, I'm doing that because that will, that is very d- dangerous. Honestly, it dehydrates the hell out of you. Everything around like 9, 30, 10 on Friday, I, I am- started PM PM that night. So I just like went through cash oil, walked all the things, did all the things. 
he, um, Colton was like, you are no longer talking to me during these contractions. Cause I was just like breathing. I was on the bio. Sorry, are we coming around? We're coming around closer to 48 hours. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. And he was like, you're no longer able to move. You're like just hanging out kind of like moving your body. And he's like, I'm going to call the midwife. And I was like, no, call Blair that, which is our photographer. I was like, call her. I was a doula at both of her births. So she was like, I know her really personally. She came over and she's like, you need to call Ruth, which is our midwife. And I was like, no, just keep waiting. Cause again, why are you, you wanting to call the midwife? Because when you call the midwife too early, then again, a new time clock starts. And so that's where I was like, okay, wait it out, wait it out. And then I was like, call the doulas and about 30 minutes later, it wasn't much longer. She was like, I'm calling Ruth. Like you are in labor. So Ruth came over. Now this is like where things obviously get blurry. So this is where sometime in between midnight and like 4 a.m. Things really started to progress. And they were, I was getting in all the positions and like innately, you know, especially whenever you've done so much work in the birth world, like what it feels like to be in labor. Like nobody ever prepares you. You can read all the things, but you don't know until you're in it. But I knew I was like, this is real. And so she checked me at one point. She's like, you're a nine and a half and almost hundred percent face. And I was like, perfect. Like in my mind, I'm thinking, great. This yeah. is like amazing news. But she was like, your cervix is swollen a little bit. So we need you to rest. Mind you at that point, I'm like, I feel like I need to push, which the whole swollen cervix thing going into a whole other thing is a very questionable term. They don't necessarily think it's like an actual thing. It's more of like, the body is protective because one, it's trying to push before your body is actually ready. And two, a lot of times what I see it correlated with and what they've been finding with research is that getting checked more creates more trauma. So then the cervix swells as protection. Got it. Which at that point I had been checked three times in 48 hours, a little bit over 48. You're like, this is your fault, Ruth. And so, and you know, looking back, I'm like, what if I wasn't checked? But it's like, you can't think about that. Mm-mm. So literally she's like, rest at that point. I was like, I can't rest. Like what the F and then probably about 30 minutes, like went by. I kind of had, I want to say like passed out. Cause I just like dazed off. And then I woke back up and I was like, I need to push right now. And she's like, let's go, let's get to pushing. So literally we were pushing and in that, like four hours before I started pushing, I was definitely like, this fucking sucks. Like there were many times. Oh where yeah. Like, you're in transition. Yeah. You're in transition. Ooh right? You can't do this, all this stuff. Colton's like, don't give pain a purpose. That was the number one thing that he kept saying was like, don't give pain a purpose. And it stuck with me going forward. So we're pushing. I'm like, it feels good to push, but I knew, I knew something when I was pushing, I was like, this feels good, but something doesn't feel right. Like mm-hmm. that's when my innate, but you're in that primal, very like out of body experience. I was mm-hmm. called like a body high. And I remember like vividly feeling like I was looking down at my body and like watching my whole support team. Cause I had two doulas there, two midwives, Colton, and then Blair, my photographer. And one of my really good friends, Sydney, who's a videographer, everybody was like, just such like a seven thing. I want a party yeah, for my right, a party. Right. Yeah. I'm like charcuterie. I took one bite of that shit earlier on in the day. And I threw it up. I was like, get this out of my, my midwives loved it, but I was like, get it out. I mean, Colton had went to my favorite brewery, bought me a six pack of beer. He's like, you're about to open a beer, get excited, all this shit. And so I'm pushing and she's like, and I just knew, and they're checking the heartbeat and she's like, something's not right. And in that moment, I was like, I know something's not right, but I'm pushing this baby out. And she's like, I need you to turn on your side. Let's try a few more things. And she's like, your baby's head is right here. She's like, but I will tell you, it is one of the worst molding I have ever felt. So I mean, the worst what? Molding, the cranial molding. Okay. So she felt like it was literally being pressured. Like, Ooh. and whenever Luca came out, his head was so coned. I've never in all the chiropractic care that I've seen, I have never seen anything like his. And so she was like, you know, I, I think he turned OP, which just means like sunny side up. And she was like, let's get on your side. Let's try to do some maneuvers, all of this stuff. All of a sudden heart rate dropped again to under 40. And she was like, we got to go like now she's like, this is an emergency. And so I, in that moment though, I will say when she said, we got to go and they're calling like, and this is where it's like, again, fuzzy Colton has to always like tell me the stories, but she had called 911 to get the ambulance there. First they call the other midwife calls all the hospitals to see who's on track or on um, the floor. And she's calling the ambulance. Colton's like, again, I'm like, we were t- supposed to be so prepared. We didn't have a birth bag, like ready just in case he like grabs this robe 
for me and like essential oils, which I'm like, love that. That's all we need. And like a pack of clothes. <laughs> but he was like, okay, these are things that we've talked about that are going to be in the bag that he's like, these are the things the diffuser, the oils and a rope. I'm like, perfect. And so in that moment though, I felt totally calm because I was like, you know, like something isn't right. Like in that moment, I didn't think, oh my God, I'm about to transfer in for a C-section. At that time I thought, oh, I'm going in. They're going to probably give me an epidural to calm my body so that I can push the baby out. Or I'm just going to need a little assistance getting the baby out. Got in the ambulance. I will tell you from this point is when I felt so much pain and so unsafe transitioning into the hospital system. The ambulance was a hot fucking mess. They uh, literally, whenever I was on the stretcher, I just happened to see my phone, which I hadn't had all night. It was like on my little birth wall thing. Grabbed my phone. I had texted my mom, hey, I'm heading in the ambulance. We're having the baby there. I didn't know that her, my mom and my stepdad and then Colton's parents were outside this whole time in the front yard. I didn't know that. They were hanging out in the car, drinking beers, waiting for the big arrival. Because we had said we don't want anyone in that space, like no family. And so we get into, it's pouring rain. Like, I mean, monsoony. And they had said, hey, it's going to be really cold when you go out here. They have this like tiny blanket. I mean, like literally exposed. Obviously I'd been Mm -hmm. naked at that point. I had a sports bra on. And I mean, they had broke the planter coming in. It's funny looking back at the ring camera videos because they had like hit the, this huge agave plant, the pot smashed it coming in with the stretcher. Cause it was that much of an emergency Yeah, and get in there. I had like black and blue bruises all over me from them trying to get an IV in. They couldn't find it. I mean, it was just a hot mess express. I get in transitioning into the hospital system in the ER again, a hot mess. This lady literally comes up to me, sticks her fingers in me. And she's like, Oh, you're about to have a baby. And I was like, yeah, I'm fucking about to have a baby. I have oxygen on me, like all this stuff. So that time was like crazy. I think about the like emergency aspect of it. And that is where I felt my body be like fight or flight 100%. Mm -hmm. Like there was no, still no thought of C-section in my mind. I was just like, what the fuck is happening? So then we went up to the actual Still delivery. Still no thought of C-section. No thought of C-section. Delivery room. The lady comes in, the OB, one of the OBs, and she's- How I know come her. you didn't get- So, okay, you still had the power to decide whether you were going to go to a delivery room versus an OR? So they just automatically take you to the delivery room. Like, okay. we didn't do anything. They just okay. took us there. And because she's like, oh, your head, the head's right here. She's thinking, oh, she's about to have a baby. Well, that midwife comes in. Colton was there at the time. It was still COVID time, 2021. So only one person could come in, but they allowed my doula, one of my doulas, Jenny, to come in with me. So she was like my ears for everything happening. And she like said, you know, she wants to, if anything happens, like this is what her birth preferences are, gentle C-section, but she really wants to push this baby out, all this stuff. And they're like, oh yeah. Oh, she, and I went through a contraction and she was like, oh, the baby's literally right here. The OB was, she's like, all right, we'll lay back. Let's push this baby out. And I'm like, all right, let's fucking do it. Like, I'm still thinking like, okay, here we are. I just need to be in a different environment. All of this stuff, just like the emergency side, like just in case. And she lets me go through two contractions back to back. And she is like, I do not want to tell you this because I know that you were just a home birth transfer in. She was like, but something is preventing this baby from coming out. And she's like, I have to take you for a C-section right now. So X, Y, and Z happen. They all come in. They're all scrubbing up. It's so quick. Jenny, my doula, Colton's in this like, what is happening right now? Yeah. As soon as you hear the C-section, I think it was harder on him in that moment because he thought this would never probably happen. Mm -hmm. and I was more of like that grounded like yeah it's fine I know all the risks they make you sign like a waiver saying that you're risking out because they didn't have time to get platelets um which is just a whole other medical side of things so they go in they're like you can only go into the OR by yourself I'm like just get me fucking out of here and get this baby out of me because at that point you're in so much pain because this is where environment is so critical at home I felt safe yeah it felt hard but at the hospital it was a whole different type of discomfort It was like emotionally uncomfortable, physically uncomfortable. They knew we were chiropractors because the OB, the hospital that we went to is right across the street from the office, like literally walking distance. So they have known about us. I knew the OB. And that's why I think too, she was like, I'll try these things. And she's like, I hate to tell you, but this is what's happening. So the care like this way forward was great. Honestly, most of it was great. 
um, went into the OR. It's a funny story is the spinal block. They couldn't get in. They had four different people come in and they, I mean, it was crazy. Like I was cussing. Cause I was like, this isn't fucking central. I don't even know like what's happening. Are you going to like fuck me up neurologically? All I could feel was like all these zaps. Plus I'm literally sitting on a donut, like a donut, um, pillow because his head was so descended down. I couldn't sit on my pelvic floor. Yeah. And so I'm like this random nurse came up. Cause again, during COVID they were short staffed. They had all these travel nurses. She had never even seen a birth of any kind. She was a trauma nurse. She came in she's like talking all these words of affirmations to me. I mean, she was great, but one of our patients now is the person who ended up getting the spinal block in me. She came literally two weeks after I had Luca to the office. And she was like, I was weirdly all CRNA. And she's like, I remember like y'all's birth vividly. Like that was a shit show, like all of this stuff. So yeah, so we had Luca and it was great. Like we had said, no small talk. Like we didn't know the gender. So Colton was allowed to, they were like, Lacey, do you want to see everything? I was like, no, get this fucking baby out of me. At that point, I'm just like, do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And so the transition was easy and we got him out and he was, he was literally great. Like, so fine. No NICU, no issues, nothing. He was pretty dry though. That's what they were like talking about. Um, but the cord, what happened is the cord was so short. It was literally like this big. Yeah. Yeah. And so they can't really see that, you know, we only did one, um, scan. We did the anatomy scan. They're not really going to see any of that. And looking back at my six week appointment with my midwife, she had seen more short cords between 2020 and 2021 with people that had either been around people that had been vaccinated or had COVID themselves. Um, and so she was like, I wonder if there's a correlation there. One of my best friends ended up having a baby the month after and had a three and a half foot cord, something Whoa. extremely rare too. And she had had COVID twice, but she was in a household where her grandma was vaccinated. So there's some like questionable things. Do I think mm -hmm. that maybe, but it's like, it's so interesting to like what came postpartum. Mm -hmm. I do feel like the planning aspect of it helped me so much. Like everything was easy in the sense of like, breastfeeding became really easy. Colton had his hands on Luca. As soon as he came out, they let him adjust him, which was amazing. And he adjusted, checked and adjusted him multiple times over the 48 hours that we were in the hospital. Um, I, you can decline a lot of things. I declined all pain meds after that, which is not for the faint of heart, but I was like, I don't want any more, unfortunately, toxins in my body than what has already been put in me, especially leading up to the C-section and the castor oil. I was so dehydrated that whenever they actually put the catheter in my, everything was brown. Oh, wow. And they were like, this is fucked up. Yeah, the like, castor oil a lot. Yeah. And like, eh. That's probably yeah. why they couldn't get an IV in you too. 100%. Yeah. It all makes sense, right? Post, you're like, oh, this all makes sense. Yeah. But yeah. And so that too, I do feel like that helped me just like prepare for the postpartum phase mm -hmm. and just knowing, okay, unfortunately, while I never thought what would happen would happen, we had those plans executed in place. Did I want to initiate those plans during? Absolutely not. But looking back, it's like, okay, we made all the right choices. We did all the things that we did and right. that was great. What do you think? So like in my head, the short cord mm -hmm. gives you, oh God, I don't mean to gives your ego brain mm -hmm. an out of there's yeah. literally nothing you could have done. Yeah. And like, if there wouldn't have been the short a cord. very anatomical reason, do yeah. you think you mentally would have held on to guilt or really guilt 100%. or shame or like checking things more so? Yeah. And you know, it's, I go back and forth about this too, because yes, anatomically, you know, everybody afterwards was like, even the doulas, the, all the OBs in there, they actually wanted to keep the placenta in the cord because they wanted to do research on it. And we said, no, um, we're going to take it with I us. Because encapsulate. Yeah. I encapsulate my placenta and I'm like, I don't really trust what you're actually doing with this. And, you know, even though I still have thoughts of like, was it truly anatomically an issue or was it my brain and my body was actually not fully connected in that point. It was it like the what if aspect of it. So there's sometimes obviously I'll go through and I'm like, oh, I could have done this differently. Mm -hmm. And it probably wouldn't have mattered the, you know, anatomical short cord aspect. But do I think that if it was completely different and if it was just like a fit, I'm going to say like a failure to progress. Yeah. I probably would have some more in the sense of needing more mindset work postpartum, 
But again, it all goes back into planning. I wasn't tied to the one outcome only Mm -hmm. because Colton and I were like, I've seen it so many times, the healthiest people end up having all these interventions that have to happen or, you know, have to happen. I say that loosely, right? but yeah, I mean, there's definitely some process and some grief that comes with that. You Mm -hmm. grief that process of, especially being right there at home right? and then transitioning into such a, I mean, sympathetic environment, truly. How did you, pro- okay, so I want to know how you process yeah. the grief, if you still are, and I want to insert a short story of like, so I am blessed that like, I had two great births. Um, yeah. So I remember being still a student, I was like 22 years old, not married, and I was at an ICPA class, mm-hmm. and it was Jeannie Ohms. And Mm -hmm. day two, okay, so anybody who's been to Jeannie Ohm's, you know, Webster class, she shows some shit, like, um, and I think they still are, I think Steph Libs, or maybe it was some, I don't know who it was, said, like, they were teaching and, like, somebody passed out, you know, like, from the videos, yep, so anyway, so it's day two, so day one, we've seen videos, and um, this woman in the class stood up a chiropractor and she's like, you know, like I've been a chiropractor for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And, and so she's tearing up and I don't remember what actually she said, but it was basically, she was processing Mm -hmm. her shame around having a Mm C-section to the group. And I'm just like, I'm not in practice. I'm just like over there, like what is happening? Cause she's crying. She is standing in front of a room of like a hundred people crying, which like as a three, I'm like, Oh my God, this is my worst nightmare. You were being, no, you're being vulnerable in front of everyone. And her birth was years ago. Yeah. And like I said, I don't exactly remember what it was like, what she was saying. My takeaway was you poor thing Mm -hmm. are still holding Mm -hmm. on. This was Mm -hmm. not like I gave birth a year ago. This was not, I gave birth three years ago. This woman had given birth closer to a decade ago and was still in tears in front of a room because she hadn't mourned whatever. Like, Mm -hmm. and so talk to me about what you needed to do, what you could have done in addition to like process that grief. Yeah. Um, so when I was in labor, I actually reached out to a lot of, I reached out to Lindsay who owns birth fit. I'd reached out to a really good friend who was a doula who attended one of my birth or one of the same births that I attended my very first chiropractic side of the birth, um, in Texas when I was in chiropractic school. And I was like, Hey, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. I had reached out to so many different moms that I knew that Hey had transferred in not even before that 24 hour mark, because I was like, I want to know what you could have done differently. Mm -hmm. So in that process of labor, I was also doing research to see, okay, is there anything more that I should be doing or anything less? So whenever it came to the outcome at that point too, like you're so euphoric as especially those first, I would say two weeks that baby is here and everyone's healthy and everything that you even really think about and it latched well too so yeah. I yeah. definitely have a great birth story but I have a pretty terrible one week yeah. postpartum. <laughs> so, yeah and yeah. that's that too I think about that all the time Colton and I have had lots of talking out conversations about it I've also done a lot of journaling a lot of meditation even in chiropractic school I don't know if anybody knows Autumn Gore Cafe mm. of Life she works in the hospital system Where at Baylor is she she has her practice still. Yeah. But she used to be like everywhere all the time. I yeah. think she has lots of babies. And so she's just, I think, mom in, and then of course running the business as well. But she, I mean, every Wednesday night, Colton and I were in her office and doing like meditation. I mean, deep, deep work. Mm-hmm. So a lot of those like what ifs about everything in life, we had already been doing that premeditative work. Okay. So I do think that made such a big difference of how my postpartum experience was and being able to put the story out there within, I think it was like a month after I had Luca, but I will say too, it still takes like lots of processing. I feel like this past year I've done really good of like, okay, it is what it is. I could have another one. And like the fear aspect of like, what if this happens again Mm -hmm. has been removed, but I've done a lot of that postpartum work. And I will say, I always think about too, my postpartum was amazing. I like Mm -hmm. never felt better. My hormones were really, really great after six months. The latch was great. I mean, literally everything minus I went back to work at 10 weeks. I wanted to come back. And this is again, Enneagram seven. I'm a Sagittarius. I'm fire signs all throughout. I asked my midwife at six weeks if I could go back to adjusting. And she was like, 
absolutely fucking not. Like, what are you doing? And I was like, it's fine. Like, I'm fine. So I was in there twice a week doing CEO stuff. And Colton's like, you got to go. Like, you cannot be here. So I do think too, like I leaned on the work, the office to kind of remove my mindset around like thinking about what happened. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until about six months after I had Luca that I was like, okay, I really need to process. I need to journal. I need to get back into moving my body intentionally and just working through these Mm -hmm. different emotions that have been almost like pushed bogged down a lot yeah. it does take a lot of self-work and self-healing when you're working through the birth process did you feel like you needed to hyper explain to patients like because I think one of the biggest issues that arises in so many other areas beyond birth Mm -hmm. is like feeling that I'm an example. And if chiropractic works, then my child should never get sick. If chiropractic works, then you should never have low back pain. You know, and so like, did you feel, not that you were like necessarily there telling every patient like, hey, I'm back and I have a C-section and this and that, but but like for the patients that didn't know the big thing, but knew enough to know like, mm-hmm. oh, you had a C-set. Did you feel the need to like hyper justify? Like, but there was a short cord, so there's nothing that like. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, it's really interesting too, because obviously with Colton and I being out of the office, the girls had texts on Thursday morning, like, hey, and Thursdays are our afternoon onlys. They're like, hey, we're going to be closed for Thursday, Friday. We'll update everyone on the status on Monday of what next week looks like. So obviously everybody, all of our patients are like, they all follow my personal social media. They're like, oh, she's going for a walk. Oh, she's in labor. You know, she hasn't posted in three days, like all these things. So they were already like texting, calling the office, trying to get updates. Because again, when you have a family-based practice, like they literally feel like they are your family. And so the girls were like, hey, you know, it's fine. Like they're in labor. It's all good. We'll keep everyone updated. They just want peace. So a lot of people were actually like, hey, you know, really great. Sending me words of affirmation through text, social media, all those things. Now, whenever I had posted like Luca was born, I think it was like Saturday or Sunday. Oh yeah, you posted Monday. the story. Yeah, it yeah. was like five days. And I was like, Luca's born, blah, blah, blah. Stay tuned for the birth story. I posted the birth story within the first month of him being born because of that, because Colton took only one week off and then he went back in and everybody was asking. And he was like, it was great. Dr. Lacey will like tell everybody about it. And people were crying. I'm not gonna lie. Especially like my uh, big families that have had all home births. They're like, we want to know every detail, you know, they're birth nerds. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was like, she'll tell when she's ready. Like it is a really exciting, crazy story. Like all this stuff. I do think people started to get to just, especially Colton was like saying the same thing over. They were like, oh, this may have not been the way that we're thinking. So that's why I put that story out there to kind of curb that. It was interesting though, because I do feel like by having a C-section, it taught me so much Mm -hmm. as a- That's what I was going to ask. Because it feels like as a doula, you went into this with such a better head than 99% of female chiros would. Yes. Because you saw, you literally got to witness, like it's one thing to hear a story like yours and be like, yeah, but like to see, like we did everything air quotes, yeah. right. And this yeah. still happened. Yes. But yeah. like, what did you learn? Yeah. And just being more supportive to moms because before and even when I was pregnant, it was like, I hate to say that I was judging because I don't ever want to say I'm judging a patient, but like a mom would come in and be like, oh, I'm going to have a plan C-section or I'm going to you know, get an epidural, do all these interventions, right? Like I'll do whatever it takes. I don't care. And I, in my mind, before I had this experience, I was like, what are you dumb? Like, have you done the research? Like, yeah, like what is that? You know? And now it gave me this whole different delivery of saying, you know what? I relate. I was once there of like, you know, being so far into one space, but you have to be okay with all the other things. I've had lots of moms in the transition of like, Hey, I want to go fully medicated to while you actually empowered me just based off of the environment that I want to entertain other options. It's also that relatability when <clears throat> home birth moms, cause I do take care of a lot of home birth birth center moms that transfer, especially during 2021 and 2022, I saw more transfers than I had in the six years that we've been open that more related, like they knew that this was a safe space. So they were immediately coming in much quicker than we ever saw any other mom, especially home birth or birth center of bringing their baby in for care immediately. Cause they knew the impact. Cause we had yeah. talked about it. 
So Colton and I have always been really open about it, especially when a mom comes in, she's postpartum freshly, she had a C-section, you know, she's dealing with postpartum anxiety, depression, all of the X, Y, and Z things that can happen. And Colton and I are able to relate to that a little bit more. And I do feel like too, with Colton as well, especially being the dad in that moment, that was something that was more, I feel like impactful to me is watching him almost like freeze and be like, holy shit, there's nothing that I can do mm-hmm. to help you in this moment. Cause he's been obviously my chiropractor. He's been my birth partner, like everything, my support person. And it was like, that was more of a grieving process of like, man, we weren't able to go through that last hour together because we had to be separate because of COVID times mm-hmm. too. So that was more of the grief process, but we've done a lot of conversations about it and talk about it in my birth class now. I think that is important too, of like just being open about it and being supportive. And it's like, hey, you know, even though you feel like you did everything, you're always going to think about the what ifs. Right. There's no way around that. But it's like, you just have to like learn from that moment and just move forward. So, right. I mean, listening to your story, there are so many moments where I would have tapped out. Um, mm-hmm. So good for you. You're a badass. Holy <laughs> shit. But do so I think Kairos are big on like, if you know, if they knew what we knew, they would do what we do. Yeah, right? yeah. And so you obviously know a mm-hmm. lot. Like mm-hmm. you have referenced research multiple times. You have done your work. Yeah. Um, not so much of like a research nerd. I'm just more of like okay. that <laughs> tells me. Um, but anyways, do you think it's possible? Obviously, it's possible. What are your thoughts on someone who knows everything that you know, mm-hmm. but you know, just how it's act, you know, it's safer to be at home. It's the 24 yeah. hour, the, the timelines, yeah. all of that. If you were to insert all of that knowledge around birth into a chiropractor, a female chiropractor, like, but they still would do like, I'm still going to do the hospital birth. I'm yeah. still going to do. And I think that like, we hang on to this. Mm-hmm. specifically with chiropractic, you're like, if they just yeah. knew about chiropractic better, yeah. they would yeah. come, they would never take breaks from care. They would get their entire family checked weekly. Mm-hmm. And like, I don't know. I think there's a big flaw in that. Like, I think it's possible yeah. to know and still make okay that. a non-ideal health yeah. choice. Well, and it's not a non-ideal. It's a definitely an informed decision as long as they've done the research and that may be their safe space too, mm-hmm. which is totally okay. That's the big thing. I would say like number one thing that you have to make sure is 100% congruent is your mindset. Whatever decision that you are making, whether you're at home, hospital, C-section, whatever it is, that you are 100% okay with the outcome or the risk factors of it. And then another thing is just like making sure that you have a great support system in that, because that's the big thing. Like I've had moms go through, I've had other chiropractic friends go through the hospital, have a vaginal, they have a medicated birth and great outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so there's no right or wrong, so to speak, way to have a baby. It's more of just like looking back and seeing what's congruent with you. Where do you feel safe? And where is your mindset going to be the best in that environment? Yeah, that's big three things. And I think that as an individual, like we are, we are each individual chiropractors. Like you can still be a chiropractor and know all this stuff Mm -hmm. and make a, you can still make an informed choice that 50% of chiropractors wouldn't choose or, you know, like, and I think just feeling safe in that, that like for whatever reason, yeah. Like maybe it was like your pregnancy super healthy, but you know, your mom had a really terrible yeah. labor. And so you just want to be in a uh, medically safe, Yeah, whatever yeah. You, you want, want to be in, in the hospital environment. setting. Yeah. And like, and just owning that and being like, that's okay. And there is space for that in chiropractic. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I honestly think millennia, we... I think this might be something that we fucked up a little bit because like, Mm -hmm. I don't hear the old guard bragging about their wives' births. Yeah, no. Like they didn't, they didn't do that. I don't, I've never sat and heard Reggie Gold or BJ or any, or Sigavus talk about my wife had an amazing birth. And so then it's like, well, where did this come from? Oh, farts. I think we did it. I think that us female chiropractors won't like- 
did it. Mabel didn't no, talk about her birth. Pressure on herself for sure. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing too. Like, and I love I, to blame the old guard for everything yeah. in my life. Like anytime I can blame them, uh, great. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't think I can blame them. Well, and social media, right? Like I do think that is a big thing. It's like you wear this badge of honor on social media, but truly nobody gives a fuck about mm-hmm. anything, how you birth, how you raise your kid. All in all, it's all about what is right for you and your family. Yep. And then social media just puts on these false, I say false personas because we see it all the time, especially with these mom influencers, mom, you know, entrepreneur, whatever that have these huge followings. A lot of them do the same type of thing. They're homesteading, they're home birthing. They're talking about every, you know, thing that is going right. But then you meet them in person and you're like, oh, there's actually so much yeah. going south. Kind of selecting and, to choose what, mm-hmm. yeah. <sighs> so I will say, I want to say something on what I do see too as chiropractors, and I see this a lot in the pediatric field as well, is it's like, okay, well, if you have a C-section, then you're setting your child up for ADHD, autism, X, Y, and Z issues. And that to me is a major red flag because I'm like, I have seen great birth outcomes actually have detrimental effects on the neurology of a child. So we can't just throw, oh, because you had a C-section, these you know different things are going to show up in your kid because it can go the other way. So I think that too, as chiropractors, and especially- but Lacey, people, it was literally storming the night you gave birth. Yeah, 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 right. And I'm like, that especially puts in a negative mindset already in the moms thinking, oh my God, I can't have a C-section because my kid's going to have autism afterwards. Mm-hmm. Or they're going to have ADHD. And I'm like, I can fucking tell you that my child is one of the healthiest kids. Mm -hmm. And we had a crazy ass You inserted chiropractic immediately to, you know, like to change, you know, to give Luca the greatest chance of moving forward. Yes, like the birth outcome, like, yes, C-sections are very traumatic. There's a lot of physical stress on the body. But I will dive deeper into there's actually a big emotional dysregulation between parents that I see more trauma show up post birth. So mm-hmm. in the sense of pediatric world. So like Colton and I talk about all the time, some of our craziest cases were home birth or birth centers, totally natural, unmedicated, no interventions, whatever, but they were stressed AF during pregnancy. That's where I see a lot of things show up. And that's the hard thing too, especially as a prenatal pediatric chiropractor who is very, very passionate about birth is I'm like, well, how can we help those women that are having these natural medic unmedicated births? The birth process goes great, but why are they still having these outcomes? Mm -hmm. And so that's where our focus has been. It's not telling people, oh, you, you know, because you had a C-section, you're going to have these things come up. Absolutely not. It's like, let's do that pre-work. And that's where preconception for me and Colton are really important. It's like, let's get you way healthy, your nervous system regulated, getting you adapted before you even think about having a baby. So no matter what the birth outcome is, you and your baby are set up really good. Yeah. 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 And I think that for, I think there's a moment I'll speak to the more ego based humans. Um, if one of the biggest concerns is what other people are going to think about you of like, Oh, she ended up having a C-section. Like Mm -hmm. it almost makes me feel like what you're assuming like you're mirroring that back to yourself. And so I think it's a good opportunity. If your concern is if I have a C-section, other people are going to have this like, "Mm, ah, like pointing moment. What is your ego sending out that you think that that's what you would get back if that was the outcome? And so I think that that is a very, Like if that is your number one concern, that probably means that on a subconscious level, you're being a dick about (laughs) birth because if other people would have anything else than, oh my God, or how are you doing? Like, I know that that's, you know, wasn't your ideal, but I also like anything other than love and support, then it may mean that you're maybe not putting out endless love and support towards that birth community. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, you just have to do the inner work no matter what. Yeah. Well, damn, I, this was one of my longer episodes, but I was like, I just want need to hear yeah. all of the things. Okay. So for those that, okay. So obviously birth work, yes. Reach out to Lacey. Yeah. Um, but the first half of our, our conversation 
was very business mindset. So yes. whether you want to reach out to Lacey for growing your practice or birth, how can people find more of you? So a few different ways. My office is at Free Spirit Chiropractic on Instagram. My personal handle is at Free Spirit Cairo. I always Which is complicated. It's complicated. I got to change it, but now I have like protection things on it. So it's like, you have to go through this process to change. You're going to change your personal handle. I think I am only because it's great. I've had it since chiropractic school. I literally have got free spirit tattooed on my hand. I had that when I made the handle, it was way before we opened our practice. Um, but it does get confusing, but it is really cool. Cause I'll get like practice members or potential new practice members follow both pages, yeah. but yes, I am going to probably change my handle at some point in the next year. But Startup Lab for chiropractors, that's on Instagram. We are about to launch a, we have two different programs that we're launching. One is in March, it's a 90 day program where we help startup chiropractors learn all the ins and outs of business. We talk about hiring associates, hiring team members, and we also talk about leveling up your practice post five years, because that's a big thing that Colton and I and Dr. Sadie at Lux Life Chiropractic, we had issues when we were first starting out our practice, we were asking all of our mentors at the time, hey, what are ideal stats? What should the first year of practice look like? And nobody could give us any straight answers, or it was very, very different. Um, So we just help you actually get the tools that you need to create the practice that you want and still staying authentic to who you are. And because different styles of different practices and different providers, everyone's individual. And so it's not just like a one size fits all program, but it's really a going back into all the birth work aspect, that inner work to figure out what you want as a business owner, what do you want in your personal life? And what do you want to see in the next three, five, 10, 50 years? And as, so, as somebody who has a program working with chiropractors from year three, Plus the number of times I see Kairos that are 10 years in and they're just like being like, oh, I didn't think about what I wanted. I just started and burned myself out. And now like 10 years in are yeah. thinking. So like, I love this idea yeah. of start yeah. with yes. It's so important. So we have one launching in March and then one launching in May. So it's a 90 day program. It's not like a coaching group, so to speak, but it's literally just an accountability program and then giving you the tools that you need. And then lastly, I have the free year frequency podcast that me and my husband, Dr. Colton Neville, we host, it's all about health and wellness. Oh, and then my social free spirit, social Cairo, which every single month just launches fun templates for the nervous system based chiropractor that sees family wellness. So also a couple different ways. Yeah. (laughs) All the ways. Such a seven. I love it. I know. Um, Thanks for showing up and being like vulnerable. You didn't cry. I teared up twice, but like (laughs) you were still talking. So I was like, Oh, I'm not gonna, I don't have to cry on camera. (laughs) I truly believe that like through listening to this, that you healed multiple different, Mm -hmm. you know, things. I think that there are people probably still holding on to their story that now feel seen and have a way like, and just like kind of reflecting light on how they can move through that trauma, um, emotional trauma. Um, And I think that like, there's a lot of Kairos that haven't Mm -hmm. given birth yet, or maybe like they did give birth and it went perfect. And so they can continue to feed that ego of like, well, if you just do everything right. And so like, I just love all the different avenues in which having these conversations can just help heal people, give more empathy to themselves and, and others. So thank you. Thank you for having me on. All right, Chi Slayers, I will have uh, the 72 different businesses that Lacey has listed (laughs) below so you can click on them. Um, But until next week, bye.